And Father, we just ask you, Lord God, in this house, Lord God, that you break up the fallow ground in our hearts today, Lord God, in us, Lord God, that you may do a work in us, Lord God, that has never been done and seen in our time, Lord God. Break up every place, Lord God, that needs to be broken up, Lord God, that we may hear, we may see, we may receive, we may act on, Lord God, your kingdom come and your will being done, Lord God. In this house, open up our ears, every deaf place in our ears, Lord God. Every deaf place, Lord God, unstop it right now in the name of Jesus, that we may hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, and not only hear, Lord God, but adhere to your word, Lord God. In this house today, Lord God, you said, behold, I will do a new thing, and it shall spring forth, spring forth in this house, Lord God, like never before, Lord God, but do it in us first, Lord God, do it in us, Lord God. May we be the people that are rescued, repaired, and restored in our whole man spirit soul and body lord god may we say yes to your will and yes to your word today lord god what you want to do lord god let your kingdom come lord god let your will be done in earth lord god as it is in heaven lord god let us see lord god the will of heaven lord god the will of god for this house lord god for our pastors lord god for the leadership lord god on to the fellowship lord god the youth lord god those that are coming in the house lord god in the precious and mighty name of jesus have your way lord god let the musicians lord god and the singers and the dancers lord god and the congregation come together lord god with your lord god giving your, you praise, Lord God, because you said you dwell in the midst of our praise, Lord. So let the high praises of God flow in this house today, Lord God, in the precious and mighty name of Jesus, that we will see your glory, Lord God, your kingdom, your glory, and your power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise your mighty name. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, Lord. I thank you, God. Thank you again, Lord, for the opportunity to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. No matter what we're going through, Lord, thank you. No matter what we see, Lord, thank you. No matter how we feel, Lord, thank you. Thank you anyway for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you for spilling your blood. Thank you for conquering death, hell, and the grave. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. We give you all the praise and thanksgiving this morning. We give you all the glory and honor today. We thank you for healing today in our bodies, Lord, in our souls, Lord, in our hearts, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you. I thank you, God, today for overcoming the enemy. I thank you, Lord, for you said all power has been given unto us. I thank you, Lord, for the power that you've given unto us, Lord. We can tread among serpents and scorpions in the name of Jesus. We bind every move in the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. Say you have no authority today in God's people. You have no power. You've already lost. You've already lost. God's word says that we are victorious in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for being victorious today. I thank you, Lord, for victory this morning. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. All that you've done, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you. For you hear the cries of your people. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, and you answer. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. For miracle signs and wonders today, Lord. And we give you all the praise and glory and honor today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you praise, give you glory, and we give you honor, God. Thank you for keeping us really safe. We love you. And I'm glad that we're with you and the rapture comes that we all come with you in Jesus name amen. amen Father God we gave you we give you glory and honor and we help you to um wake up we go to church and we um have fun at church and 
and we give you glory. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dad, that, that you woke us up today. I, pr I thank you that we came today to worship God. And I pray that that we have a good praise and worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God, for blessing us and keeping us safe and watching over us. And as we praise and worship the God who blessed us and we will have a great praise and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning. We thank you for giving us just some peace of sleep last night. When I wake up this morning, I gave praise, joy, and honor. We ask you, Lord, to, to let us um, learn something in you and share this church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for our children. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. We worship you, we magnify you, we lift you up. For you alone are worthy, worthy of all glory, worthy of all honor, worthy of all praise, Lord God. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So let's lift them up. Let's lift our Savior up. Let's lift our Father up. Hallelujah. Let's lift them up today. Hallelujah. 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 We give you praise, hallelujah. We give you glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, yes, hallelujah. Yes, Thank you, Jesus.
worship the King. Worship the King. Oh, worship the King. Worship the King. Yeah, worship the King. Worship the King. For He is ours. He is our Lord. In this place.
Circle round here, and they cry. 
put a challenge out to the, to the adults. Next Sunday, I want you to memorize the 23rd Psalm. I don't hear many takers in here this morning. Okay. I'd like you to memorize the 23rd Psalm. We're waiting for them to get the internet back up and running again. One thing I have noticed is that there is a famine in the body of Christ in which many people are acting like they have sustenance in them, but there's no evidence and I think one of the things that fools many people is when they see someone that has a large stature, they think they must be full of something. But I want you to know, we are lean in the church. Amen. And the only way for that to be dealt with is for us to learn how to get into the Word of God, get on our knees and pray. And as the Word of God states, certain things only come out but by fasting and praying. They told me that if you want to lose weight, you have to eat. And they were right. Because so many people think that if I stop eating food altogether, I'm going to lose weight. It doesn't work that way. You have to have something to actively participate inside your body to help you to burn the calories and get your metabolism flowing the right way which means you have to eat something and eat the right thing and eat at the right time. The church has a difficulty with not eating at the right time. Did a teaching a little while ago. Let me know when you're back up and running again for the internet up there. The church has the habit of eating inconsistently. We eat when we think we absolutely, necessarily, positively have to, and not when we're required to. See, if we eat at the right time in the right way for the right reason, we should stay fit, spiritually speaking. But if we do things just because I have no other choice but to get it done, we'll never be fit. Because the body has a habit of remembering how you treat it. <laughs> So when the time comes for you to really utilize the body in the way you want to, the energy and everything else is not there because it remembers last time what you did to me. And consequently, 
we're losing in the game. We're not doing it the right way, the right time, for the right reasons. Why pray to God when I have to? When I should be praying to God just because I need to. And here is where the plight of the church has been lodged for so many years. We act like we know what we're doing, but we really don't. And God is saying, I want you to be participators, partakers of my blessing. If I'm a partaker of God's blessing, I should know that I am blessed. Oh, we say it many times, and, you know, we repeat to other people, the blessing of the Lord, it make it rich, and I didn't know sorrow with it. You know, I'll bless the Lord at all times, his praise should be my mouth. I will bless this, I will bless that, I will bless the other. When God made me in Genesis, first chapter 26, verse, he, and he blessed them, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. So we see blessings have been afforded to us. But are we truly blessed? Because blessings do not simply go with just words. If I speak blessing over you, there has to be a willingness to accept what God has given to me and to participate with it and to pass it on to somebody else. What good is a blessing if I hold on to it? If I don't offer what I've been given to somebody else, how can I expect God to multiply the blessing he's given to me? I can go to you and say, I bless you in the name of Jesus, bless you in the name of Jesus. But if you do nothing with it, it's redundant now. It's stuck right there. And that's what it means by the blessing of the Lord, make it rich, had it no sorrow, because we are not supposed to walk around holding on to what God gives us. Come on. Come on. Come on. <clears throat> well, pastor, if I don't hold on to it, I'm not going to be able to have more. <laughs> That's a lie. Holding on to anything just catches dust. It has no active participation in your life. It's only when we release what we've been given that we have the capacity or room to get more. And God wants you to have more. More. I'm going to speak about more in a minute. I'm continuing my teaching from last week. You can go ahead and put it up. You may be seated, those of you who are standing. I know you have some anticipation working today. I'm going to go ahead and release the praise team so you can get back to your seats. And uh, as we wait, they'll let me know when we're back up and running again. If not, we'll just have to do it without the Internet today. I'm not going to let the Internet slow me down. Amen. Praise God. It's amazing how dependent we are on technology. While you guys are doing that, are you able to get this song for me that goes, Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Are you able to get that song for me? I just feel like blessing God for a few minutes.
live yet. Are we live? I think we in the church would be lost without technology. There was a day when praising God was not an assumption. It was an automatic response to the fact that God did something for me this week. So I'm going to go to the house of the Lord and I'm going to praise him with all of my heart, with all of my soul, mind, will, emotion, and intellect. I didn't depend on a, a, a guitar, didn't depend on an organ. Didn't depend. The only organ I depended on was my mouth and my hands and my feet. And I would dance before the Lord. The Bible didn't say play the instruments and make a joyful noise, O ye saints.
I had a feeling when I prayed about this this week that it was going to be a hardship for some people to have to deal with this that I'm speaking on this morning. Many of you I know I preached on last week, putting away your idols. Amen? And there was a general description about idols. Holy Spirit told me today to focus the idols in the area of marriage. Hmm. Uh, some people, did some people leave the sanctuary? I want everybody to be in here, to be into what I'm talking about. Amen? Amen. So if you know your spouse is missing out of the sanctuary, go outside and get them. Drag them by their feet and tell them, come back in here. Amen? Amen. I remember the days when I dealt with me to the point where my wife had to come to church some Sundays without me because I was sort of late getting home from the club the night before, the after hour joints, things like that. I mean, I didn't do all the dirt that some people did in the after hour joints. It didn't make me any less a Christian. It didn't make me any more a Christian either. All I knew was that was my lifestyle on the weekend and on Sunday. If I can make it in the morning, I'll get up and go to church. While my wife was praying that one day one day, Lord, one day, Lord, you'll bring this man to a place where he gets on his knees and acknowledge you. Now, let me say this to you, because some of you would use that as a tool to say, because my spouse is acting a certain way, I've got to put up with that stuff. Let me tell you, you don't. Amen? Yes, you pray for them, but stupidness is not part of the equation when it comes to dealing with a spouse who is doing things like laying their hands on you and treating you in such a way that you are less than. Amen? Now, I want to make that clear because some people think that I can go ahead and be a good spouse, be a good wife, be a good husband while my spouse treats me like a piece of dirt. That God didn't require that of you. Amen? Then require that of you. And I'm less than if I say to you, put up with that just because. I can try to win you while you're not around. I'm talking to somebody this morning. I can try to win you when you're not around. If your husband or wife are treating you a certain way and you're doing and allowing these things to happen just because you think God is saying to me, don't divorce them, don't leave them, let the unbelieving spouse deal with this thing a certain way, and you're putting up with all of this physical harm in your, in your home, you are out of order. Why am I going this way? Father, I ask you this morning to help me to address this with caution, with tact, with being humble, Lord God, with being precise concerning what you've given me to speak on. Let me not bite my tongue. Let me not waver in any way. But to put the word directly into the bullseye of that which you'd have it to be this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray, and God's people said amen. amen. You might not agree with everything I say this morning, but I want you to at least listen to what's being said. Amen? Based on many studies, the rate of divorce in the church is no different from the rates of those who do not admit to serving God. I didn't get one amen on that. Let me go a little further. This, I would say, is a direct in, <laughs> indication that many of us are operating in a form of godliness, but denying the power that was given to us by Jesus before he ascended to the Father in heaven. If Jesus left us peace, why are we so embroiled in so many conflicting agendas and not trusting in the Holy Spirit 
who is supposed to lead us and guide us into all truth. I firmly believe that one of the major issues that we deal with in marriage today is mistrust. Many deal with the trust issue. Quiet in this place. We tend to gauge our relationships based upon those people who impacted our lives previously without obtaining closure in those things that crept into our atmosphere during the low points of our former relationships. And because we did not deal with the baggage, the residue lingers and slowly becomes incorporated in the next and the next and the next relationship. After a while, we begin to notice how easily it is to drift in the current relationship we're in now because we fail to deal with the baggage of the past. We tend to say to ourselves, we do not necessarily need deliverance in those areas knowing that we have the issues in them. After all, I don't want to look bad to the other people in the church, including the pastors and the leaders. So I will just deal with it the best way I can. The issue is that any worm that's left in the apple will not allow the apple to heal. Any virus left unattended will eventually slow down the processor and cause auto malware to infect the PC. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the computer right now. Then when everything slows down, we simply deal with the slow down PC, making the hard drive less capable of handling the complex work of daily life. And when it gets noticeable, we just put that PC to the side and get a new one. Will we treat our marriages that way? No. But don't we? I would like to continue from what I started on last week about putting away idols. Today I'm dealing with the idols that affect our marriages. There are many more than I can give you today because there are <laughs> too many. But I'm going to hit a few of them. So many people are unwilling to deal with issues in marriage. I can sit up here and tell you some things that you might have said to me along the way in my 20-something, 30-something, 40-something years of whatever it is. I forgot how long I've been alive, but even though I'm 27, I remember that, okay? <laughs> but in all the years I've been dealing with people in marriages, I've heard some doozies. For, for the sake of not trying to influence what you might have said to me, notwithstanding five or six more people might have said the same thing, because you feel as though your issue is so unique. You're the only person dealing with that thing. Nobody else has the problems I have. Forever the victim. Forever the victim. So I'm going to try to stay a little bit on the nominal side as I speak about the different idols we deal with in marriage. As not to step on your toes too hard at the very beginning, I'll start and label the first one materialism. M-A-T-E-R-I-A-L-I-S-M, -E materialism. Going to go to <laughs> Seems like I have my old notes in here and not the new one. Something is amiss. Can we I had updated some things this morning in my computer and I see that went back to the old document that I had before. Give me a moment. Do me a favor, bring my laptop off my, along with the wire, 
off of my desk back there. I know I have all my gentle notes. I need my phone right there too, please. I'm always backed up. And if I don't have it backed up, I'll preach it out of my head. I just want to stay within the vein of what we have prepared. Amen? Amen. Nobody can preach it better than the Holy Spirit. I was revising some things on the Passover Seder this morning. And it caused me to have to reboot after the internet went out twice already this morning. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for. Lord. Are we still having difficulty with the internet up there? Praise God. Thank God for my PC that has all my updated files inside of it. So I have a problem. The internet just doesn't seem to do right. But hey, Jesus paid the price. You know, tomorrow evening, we're going to be gathering together for what's called a Seder, the Passover Seder. One of the directives that was given to us for the Seder is that we have to search out the hidden manna, I mean the hidden leaven in our lives and remove it. This leaven it speaks about is interpreted as sin. Amen? Amen? We are to remove sin that has been hidden and ignored for periods of time. Even the sins that we think we don't really know about, that all of a sudden God reveals to us you're dealing with this, dealing with that. So many of us think that as uh, long as nobody knows, I'm okay. I've spoken to this issue in my office, at my home, in my vehicles, a thousand and fifty times in which people believe that if no one knows about my sin, why do I need to keep bringing it up? And what we've come to understand, the importance of being forgiven for something because you're found out, or being forgiven because you admitted the fact that you need forgiveness. 
The Bible calls it godly sorrow. Are you repenting because somebody figured out you're dealing with an issue? Or are you repenting because God said to you, you need to deal with this now? As I mentioned earlier before, that uh, we shouldn't have to wait until we get hit over the hammer by the Holy Spirit to determine our need for repentance. I mentioned earlier also the fact that the rate of divorce is no different than that in the world. The church is not doing much better when it comes to that area. But I remember what the word of God says, Jesus left me his peace. He says, not ordinary peace, I leave you my peace. That's a peace that passes all understanding. To keep your hearts and minds stayed on him. So what, what are we doing with the peace that God left us? Now, I want to get directly into these various areas of idols that we deal with. What did I say the first one was? I only said one so far. Without having to shout it out, does anyone understand what materialism really means? Let's look at Luke, the 12th chapter, and the 15th verse. So it'll give you a chance to really get into your Bible this morning. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. When you're there, say amen. amen. And it reads this. And he said unto them, take heed and beware. That's a double whammy warning right there. Take heed. In other words, pay attention and beware. Beware of what? Covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possessed. It's a good thing for a man to work. How many of you know that? Matter of fact, the scripture says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. And it's, an, it's nice to sit back and look at the fruit of your labor. But there has to come a time when you ask yourself, when is enough enough? If you find yourself always at work and not in the Word, more time playing and not enough time praying, you need to reassess your priorities. But pastor, I'm just preparing for later, preparing for a rainy day. It rains every month of every year, and into each life a little rain must fall. The word reminds us we ought to lay up our treasures where moth and rust cannot corrupt and where thieves cannot break in and steal. It also says where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be also. So many people have sacrificed everything at the altar of more. Got to have more. The need for a bigger house, a better car, bigger bank account. It drives them to where they become obsessed with materialism. Have to have three or four jobs just to pay for the stuff I've got to dust every week. God doesn't want us to obsess over things. Can't take it with you. Some people are so driven by this, they've got to provide more, got to have more, have to see more. If I can just show the Joneses how, how good God has blessed me, God didn't bless you with that stuff. If you're doing it to show somebody else, that's not a way of saying God gave it to you. You see, the thing we have to look at in life is that when it comes to your family, moments matter more than money. Moments matter more than materials. 
be careful you don't get in, sucked into a life that lies to you and tell you having more stuff will make you happy. It won't. As you get older, you tend to look back at the moments more than you look back at the money. Did I spend enough time with my husband? Did I spend enough time with my wife? Did I spend enough time with my children? There's a song, I think it's by John Croce or something like that, The Cat's in the Cradle. It talks about, you know, will you be coming soon, Dad? No, I'm not coming back right now. I've got things to do. And the son grew up just like the daddy. Because the daddy wasn't there for the son, now the son doesn't have time for the daddy. And consequently, we are more into materialism than we are into making moments with our family. If you must choose, choose to make moments over getting more stuff. In the end, when the stuff is no longer there, when the thieves break in and steal it, when the fire takes it away, when you can't pay the bills because you have so much stuff, didn't pay the rent or the mortgage, and they take the stuff, what will you have left? Pastor, get off my toes. Let's go to number two. Number two, I'd like to title it ministry. Ministry. Wait a minute, Pastor. Don't you want us to be in ministry? Hear me out. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It says, nevertheless, I have somewhat to get. You see, most of these scriptures I'm reading to you is Jesus himself speaking. <clears throat> Just like when I taught about the NIV version of the Bible a few weeks ago, I don't think many of you recognize that most of it were red letters. The things that they're eliminating from the Bible is eliminating what Jesus is trying to say to the body of Christ. And the Bible is trying to remove it. They're saying it's redundant. It's being repeated too often. It doesn't take all that. Nevertheless, I have something against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, Therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except you repent. See, sometimes we can let ministry get in the way of God. Let ministry get in the way of our family. And that's not what God wants. Amen. This is an example of something good that has the potential of becoming an idol in your life. Serving in ministry is a good thing, a good way to give back and to use the gifts and talents God has given you. But after a while, many of us get to the point of saying, you know what? I look good doing this. Everybody's telling me how good a job I do. So what do I do next? Get more into it. And I neglect or negate the importance of my children, the importance of my spouse, the importance of other things that God has placed for me to do. You see, not everything given to you is for you to keep forever. And ministry is one of them. So many of us think that when we get into certain ministry, because we do a good job of it, that's my job forever and ever. Amen. If you cannot see yourself out of work in that ministry, in that area, within two years, you're not doing a good job. <clears throat> the only part I think that we should tarry a little longer with is pastoralship. Because it's hard. Not easy being a pastor. But at the same token, many people are flocking to that very thing right now because they think there's money involved in it. Or there's prestige involved in it. Every singer or rapper that made one song and got popular doing it are not trying to become pastors. Why? They want the limelight. They want ministry to serve them. And now we have more pastors than we have people. 
In other words, so many chiefs and not enough Indians. Everybody I speak to down the road right now, I'm pastor so-and-so, I'm the right reverend, bishop so-and-so. And now being a bishop is not good enough anymore. People are sending me little, little, what do you call those things, shorts or clips or whatever they have on YouTube and stuff like that, reels, whatever they call them. And they're saying to me, Pastor, look at this, Pastor, look what, why do I want to see crap, garbage, when I'm trying to hear what God is saying at the same time? I showed my wife one the other day, a certain pastor praying for somebody. And he was praying for something. I couldn't understand what he was saying because the language was a little bit different than what I'm accustomed to. But he was grabbing the man's private parts in the middle of the sanctuary while he's praying for him. Another one was telling people he went to heaven and spent an hour and 45 minutes in heaven. Angel took him around. And in the fact that he went around, there was this big, bright, white car he was in. Then he went on to say, it was a Range Rover. Now we have idols in heaven, Range Rovers. They're supposed to help us to be able to get around from point A to point B. What I didn't ask, was it electric or was it gas? Because that's the thing we're dealing with right now in the church today. If we are the people who believe in gas vehicles, we get angry with those who have electric vehicles and vice versa. Why? Because we're dummying down the kingdom to a donkey and an elephant. Who we're for is who we have to come against. Because after a while, everybody who was Democratic one time will become Republican sometime in their thoughts. And those who are Republican will become Democratic sometimes in their thoughts too. Because we change like the wind changes. When things please us, we turn from being one to another. And that's what's happening in many of our marriages today. We heard somebody said something, we go home and try it and realize it really didn't work for me. One thing I've learned about ministry, it doesn't stop. Once you say, I do, you have to keep doing why don't we treat our marriages the same way? Why don't we tell ourselves the fact that in front of the face of God, in front of the face of man, I said to you, I do. See, we start eliminating certain things from the marriage vows right now. I will say for richer, but God forbid you become poor. I'm leaving you behind. We can say a lot of things about in sickness. No, not in sickness, only in health. I don't want with you. I, I can't hit deal with you if you're sick. Try to take care of my business right now. So we have started eliminating the process of how we ought to get married. The first thing God says about marriage is: shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife? Doesn't stop there. And the two are supposed to become one flesh. Not just one, one. In other words, when they see one, they ought to see the other. So when they praise one, they ought to praise the other. No real man goes around slapping his wife around. No real woman goes around talking about her husband so bad that when you see them, you see opposites. Since ministry never stops, you have to learn how to stop sometimes. It is appropriate to serve and to serve with all of your heart. But make sure in your service you give your spouse their time. Now, no, wait, Holy Spirit is telling me to go and add this to it. Don't have it in my note. If that spouse is doing things contrary to the will of God, be careful how much time you put into it. Because you cannot seriously and honestly and faithfully pray for them when they're tearing away from the marriage and defiling the marriage bed. Yeah. 
But hopefully, we're speaking of people who are both trying to I intensify their desire to love God and then to love each other. But if you discover ministry is getting in the way of your marriage, it's time to reevaluate the amount of time you're spending in ministry away from your spouse. Your first ministry is to God, then it's to your spouse. If you neglect those things, it's only a matter of time before this house starts coming down. See, some people tend to use the example as a means to do less for the kingdom. And that's not what I anticipated or tried to bring an analogy to. There's a time and a place for everything. There's a time to be Martha, there's a time to be Mary. Number three, comparison. Comparison. Not to be an idol. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17 Exodus 20 and 17. And we see this in sometimes other ways of looking at it, but I want to bring it into comparison this morning. It says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet his manservant or his maidservant nor his ox, nor his donkey. Word says ass, but I'll go with donkey. Nor anything that is thy neighbor's. In other words, what belongs to them, let it remain theirs. You don't know what it took for them to get it there. And when you start comparing yourself to themselves, are you willing to put in the work it took for them to get what they got in order for you to have what you think you ought to have? He's just so-and-so riding around on a Bentley. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to have one next week. People look at me funny when I said I'll never buy a new car again in the rest of my life. Every car I purchased within the last four or five cars I paid cash for. Let me tell you why. You'll never catch me paying that upfront money for any brand new car. I let somebody else buy it. Let them spend the first year and a half to two years doing all they have to do to get it together. Just before the warranty runs out, I'll take it off your hands. Because I know that the upfront money is no longer my responsibility. You paid the price for that. And my car is still looking new. It's new to me. I'm not going to have all the other extra stuff that you had to worry about taking it back to the dealership for this, dealership for that. And you were in the car less than you were out of the car. I don't have those issues. When they bring a new model out, I don't go buy one right away. I wait till, till you guys figure it out. When you've decided, okay, this is wrong, that is wrong, I've got to get this. And when you've done that and the dealership gets it right and the manufacturer corrects all those problems, no more recalls on it, good. Now I can buy that car. But some of us, we want the newest thing. We want to compare what we have to everybody else. Because the next door neighbors have one, I have to have one too. After all, I'm serving God. I need to show them what God can do. Which God are you serving? One of the most dangerous things that you and I can do is compare our marriage to somebody else's marriage. Or even attempt to pattern your marriage after somebody else's marriage. Just be you. Everybody else is taken. As I've observed relationships over the years, I've realized that no two marital relationships will ever be the same. Since every person is different, each relationship is different and has to have a uniqueness that cannot be duplicated. And you should not attempt to put your marriage in the same shoe or the same house that somebody else has theirs in. What works for one couple may not work for you. This doesn't mean you can't learn from other couples. If they experienced some stuff and they suffered loss, don't go down that road. But not because they overcame something means I've got to go down the same road they did. It means you must consider them in light of your own 
relationship. Your goal should not be to be a better version of somebody else's relationship. It should be to be the best version of your relationship. After all, this is why God joined the two of you together in the first place. Opposites attract. Number four, busyness. Busyness. I'm going to use Romans 12, 2 and 3 as scriptures for that. See, we in the church have to have a scripture to cover everything. So I'm, I'm doing it. Sometimes some pastors, you know, I've, I've been guilty of this over the years, putting scriptures on it because one word is in there, but the whole thing has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. And I try to not let myself fall for that anymore. I try to make sure that what I'm speaking on, that scripture relates and represents what I'm speaking of. Otherwise, how can I expect you to get help, needed help, if I'm giving you something that does not relate to what I'm talking about? That's redundancy. That's stupidity. Amen? Amen. Romans 12, 2 and 3. Many of you know this scripture. And be not conformed to this world. But be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Hmm. See, we've all been given a desire to do things. Don't necessarily mean we always do it. Sometimes the television, the telephone, or telling somebody else, social media, whatever gets in the way. But you see, what are these things are doing to your life is making you busy. Because before you know it, you spend three or four hours watching videos on a little tiny box called a camera, no, I mean a phone. But we treat it more like a camera than we do a phone. The minute something happens, we can record it real quick and show people what we found out. I was there when, they, when, she, when she smacked them in the mouth. And we get busy about everything we should not be busy about. There's a phrase or a title given to people like that. It's called busybodies. There are more busy bodies in the church today than they are in the, in the outside world. Because everything that happens in the church that in our mind is unlike God, we've already made a record of it. <clears throat> we are probably more busy than we've ever been before in our lives. I know you can say society has a lot to do with it, but why are we listening to what society says? We get so busy doing what they said. Why are you doing that? Because they said it's the right thing to do. Why are you wearing that today? Because they said the temperature is going to be so and so. I told my kids one day, when I find day, I'm going to kick his, you know what? I get tired of hearing what they said, they done, they don't want to do. And the minute I find they... It's him or her and I. Amen? We're going to have a little powwow. When we want to blame society for our busyness, we want to blame the fact that we carry around three phones, one to hide, one to cry, and one to tell whomever that the, that the reason why we're hiding and crying. Most people today... They wear busyness as a badge of honor. I can't talk right now. I'm kind of busy. Hey, pastor. Baby, can we talk? Can we do it tonight when I get back home? I, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on a long distance right now with my boss, you know. When you come back home, she's no longer there. 
See, how do you know if you're falling victim to business and it's creeping into your marriage? Should I give you a couple of pointers? If you only see your spouse before you leave for work in the morning or before you go to bed at night, you might be too busy. If your calendar is filled with activities and responsibilities and none includes time with your spouse, you might be too busy. If every conversation ends with, I can't talk now, I've got to handle this Zoom call, you might be too busy. You want 15 more? You figure it out. In these instances, and others like it, business is not a badge of honor. It's a recipe for disaster. If you're too busy, it's time to let some of this stuff go. Remember that part of being married is sharing life together. But wait a minute, Pastor. I work two jobs. She stays at home. Do I take my glasses off for this one? <clears throat> Do we believe that staying at home is not a job? Do we believe that taking care of your dirty socks and your dirty drawers is not a job? Do we think that picking up after you every single morning that you, you know, you drop your stuff where you came in the house is not a job? And if by chance you're working two and she's working one, that's more of a job. Because some of us now get influenced of the fact that because we both have jobs, and if you don't do what I think you ought to be doing, when you ought to be doing it, then we're not on the same page. Remember I talked about the baggage before that we tend to hold on to? We carry it. We infect the PC with what we thought was the right thing to do. Why am I going backwards? I want to do this for a reason. Because we put the old in with the new. One thing I didn't mention when I spoke about the PC was this. In the past, when you bought a new PC, you would get copies of the original, um, no, not backups, I, I, the, the programs that you installed on the PC and reinstall them on the new PC. Then all of a sudden, some bright person, probably never had a spouse, decided what I'm going to do from now on is make it easier for you. We're going to make a way that you can mirror the old one with the new one. So when you get the new PC, you add one wire between them. Now it's wireless. And you can just transfer everything from the old into the new. What they failed to mention was this, that whatever was causing the infection of the old is now being transferred to the new. And it's only a matter of time before the infection infects the new PC. And we're so accustomed to holding on to something for a little while because it was slowing down, then say, you know, I can't deal with this no more. Buy me a new one. And then we turn around, new one, looks good, smells good, sounds good, does the body good, and we use it for a while and it starts to slow down. We wonder why. The old stuff you never dealt with is now infecting and slowing down the new one. And this is what's happening in many marriages today. The baggage you brought from the old marriage, the old relationship, is now causing you hassle in the new marriage and new relationship. And how can you relate to somebody when there's more than two of you in the ship? You have to make your spouse a priority. Because if you don't, somebody else will. It's difficult to bring your spouse back into their rightful place after you remove them from that position. That includes your children, too. You never put your children in front of your spouse. God made an order. He says, male and female made he them, and he give them dominion. If you have children, they come under. They don't come in front of or before. But you know what? 
I had to, you know, put my wife here, put my husband there, put this there, put that there. And, you know, and, but if I have a child, I have to put the child in front. If I have a mother, I have to put my mother before my spouse. That's not the way God said it. Shall a man leave his father and mother? Not only physically, mentally. Leave it and cleave unto your spouse. Now, again, like I said, unless that spouse is beaten on your rear end, okay, you don't have the, the right. No man or woman has the right to touch another person in a negative fashion like that. Now, if you're in the spankings, all that kind of stuff, I have no hope for you. That's between you and God. <clears throat> if you're a sadist or a masochist, I'm not getting in the middle of that, okay? <clears throat> Number five, complacency. Y'all trying to keep me here until 2 o'clock, and I'm not going to be here until 2 o'clock. Complacency. Ecclesiastes 9, 9 and 10. I have to read this from two versions to really get you to understand what I'm talking about. Ecclesiastes, I'm going to read verse 9 and 10 from the King James. I'll just read verse 9 from the other version. Verse 9 and 10 says this in the King James. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity which he had given thee under the sun. All the days of thy vanity. Why do you repeat that? I could teach on that for two hours. For that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work, no device, no knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you're going. I'm just going to read in verse 9 from Ecclesiastes again, chapter 9. It says, live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. In other words, just don't look for the good stuff. Do it when, when the bad stuff is happening too. Amen? Amen? The wife God gives you is your reward for your earthly toil. Ooh, ouch. Explain that, Pastor. If you treat her like dirt, expect to get dirt back. Most relationships go through stages. And here's where many people in marriage don't want to take the stages of life. If you remember the story of the, the person who sits over the gold and watches it, or sits over the silver and watches it, and look for all the impurities to rise from the bottom, and then he skims it off at the right time. And they won the wise man putting up with all of this heat in his face, just looking at this silver or this gold. And somebody asked him one day, when do you know when the gold or the silver is ready? He says, when well, I can see my reflection in it. This is what God is trying to do for you and I. You go into the crucible of life, into the furnace of affliction, and when he puts you in there, whether through your spouse, your husband, or your wife, you cry bloody murder because you're going through something. When the only way for God to see his reflection in you is to put you through the fires of life to get you to the other side. Would you see, Pastor, I believe a marriage should always be in a honeymoon stage. That means you're not growing. You don't have a honeymoon forever. I'm looking at some faces right now, looking back at me, and I'm, I'm not scared. <clears throat> See, when you go to the honeymoon stage, after a while, something has to change. You can't keep a honeymoon stage going when you've got kids running after your coattails. 
The honeymoon's almost over then, okay? You have another stage you have to deal with. Now you have to settle into raising a family. Even if you don't have children, you can still settle into a place where you're comfortable with each other. You know, I've taken her for granted. and See, I've already got her, so why, why should I keep, fight to keep her? Why do I have to go through all that stuff, Pastor? I already got her. She said, I do, so now she better do. You see, because if you keep on thinking she's going to do, you're going to be in a heap of doo-doo. See, the challenge of this right here, this that I place under complacency, is that we feel we can keep doing the same thing over and over again and nothing's going to change. You have to fight through the idols of complacency. And remember the things about your spouse that made you fall in love with them in the first place. And sometimes when you look at this relationship, you didn't really refresh or F this the hard drive. Anybody know what F this the hard drive really is? Clean all the crap out of it. When you F this something, you get all the old memory, all the old stuff that's been, you have to do that for all your past relationships. I told every single person that comes to me right now for marriage, pastor, can you get it? we want to get married next month. We want to, if, unless you got that girl pregnant, whatever the case may be, maybe you have the wrong doors, I don't know. But I want to make sure you get some counseling before you get married, which means do it the right way. Do it the right way. I could say a lot more on that, but time wouldn't let me. Praise God. See, you can have more problems when you have children. Because not only are you worried about what's happening in you and your spouse's relationships, you're worried about what's happening in the kids. And how, how are the kids seeing what I'm doing? Because the apple does not fall far from the tree. Whatever they see you doing, watch out. They'll be doing it too. When you see your kids acting out of pocket, Remember, mommy or daddy taught them how to do that. You can't become complacent in your relationships. Number six. I think I'm just going to go with seven. It's a good number. Another idol we can have in our marriages, each other. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 says this. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. As I said before, everything in life has a potential to become an idol. Sometimes the one we position in front of Christ is the one we're married to. <clears throat> and not necessarily because the person's doing everything right, because they're doing so much stuff wrong that we fail to go to Christ on their behalf. We deal with their issues. Before long, we find ourselves going through boxes and boxes of tissues because we didn't go to God to get us in the place to deal with it. Now, granted, you're obligated to that person that you marry, but Christ must always be your priority. If you mix this up, you neglect the one who can empower you to have any type of decent marriage, either now or in the future, either with this person or the next ones to come. Christ at the center of your marriage does not mean you'll have a perfect marriage. So many people think because I pray, because I talk to God, I should have a perfect marriage. It positions you to have one filled with love and grace, two of the ingredients necessary to produce a long and healthy marriage. I've spoken to older women and older men who said, you know what? What causes us to, to last all these 50-something years and 60-something years of marriage? I put up with their crap, but I allow God to speak to my heart concerning their crap. <clears throat> 
Some other ones say some other things. They were very sexual oriented, but uh, I'm not going to get in the pulpit and say that this morning. Praise God. Number seven, an idol could be in your marriage. Ouch. Ooh. Let me give you the scripture first. Proverbs 5, 18 through 21. Pastor, should you read the scripture first before you name it? Yeah, I should. Proverbs 5, 18 to 21 says this, Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasure row, pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman, and embrace the bosom of a, bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Number seven is labeled pornography. Pornography is sneaky because people often engage in it in the dark, thinking nobody knows. But pornography has an addictive nature. It creates unrealistic expectations of what sex with a mar marital relationship ought to be like. It doesn't paint a picture of healthy, loving sexual relationships. At best, it stirs up lustful passions within those who watch it, which can lead to other issues such as adultery, unfulfilling sexual intimacy, assumptions in the mind, because we watch this, we might have watched it together, but all of a sudden you, you, you make that spouse guilty of what you saw on that, on that movie. Or maybe by chance you dreamed of what you watched. There are days when I would wake up in the morning, look at my wife and say, why would you do that to me? It was a dream I had the night before. Had nothing to do with anything she said or done. But now I'm looking at her in an accusatory type of attitude because in my dream she did this. <clears throat> Pornography has the ability to fulfill things in you that you don't want fulfilled. What you want is a healthy and satisfying sexual relationship that's based on mutual love, mutual respect, and a mutual desire to satisfy each other. I've said some things in marriage counseling to some people, and they say, Pastor, you agree with all of that? And some other time they would say, well, I can't go back to him for counseling because he agreed with some crazy stuff. Whatever way you look at it, if the Bible speaks about something and say it's okay to do, who am I to tell the Bible it's wrong? Amen? You want me to say here what it means? No, I'm not going to say that right now. <clears throat> None of these things are present in pornography. You're not going to have mutual love. You're not going to have mutual respect. You're not going to have mutual desire to satisfy each other in pornography. It's always somebody bringing unrealistic expectations before your face to make you think, we can do that. And if we don't, we begin to blame one another. You're not doing it the right way. You set yourself up for failure when you try to use somebody else or something else to bring ratification. Amen? One of the greatest joys in marriage is being able to express yourself sexually in a relationship with someone that you know loves you and cares about you, even when you're not doing everything the way they think you ought to do. But they're willing to work with you in the marriage bed that we can work this thing out together and not accusing you of anything else because. No type of pornography can ever duplicate the level of desire, expression, and communication. As a married person, you don't need pornography to enhance your sexual experiences because it won't. If you invest the time with each other and learn to talk to, communicate, whether you are in the bedroom or outside of it, 
that would allow you to create more enjoyment than any pornography could ever do. Somebody told me a long, long time ago, you don't make love to your wife at night, at 10, 11, 12, 2, 1 through the morning. You make love to her during the day when you call on that phone. And you say sweet things to her together in a place of thinking about you. You don't wait until you want something and then start rubbing her in the rear end. Pastor, where are you going with this? I, I, I'm, I'm not defiling my pulpit. Amen? What should we remember about a healthy relationship, a healthy marriage today? <clears throat> I want to bring you scripture again. In Mark chapter 10, starting at the 6th verse, it says this. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. And the two shall be one flesh, so that there are no more two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. <clears throat> Don't let anybody else's opinion about your spouse cause you to darken the doors of depression any darker than what it is right now. See, some of you are carrying stuff from the past that's clouding your mentality. You're holding on to stuff that's keeping you bound, and you're trying to go into a marriage right now, or maybe you might have let one go because it just didn't work out. And I'm not saying... You know, you shouldn't get divorced. I'm not saying none of the above. I'm saying by chance, you went through that, and now you're on the other side working with somebody else. Please, take care of the baggage that you experienced in that former relationship. Because if you carried into this next one, you're going to moments like, that's why I couldn't trust him in the first place. That's why I couldn't trust You see, most of the time, the one you go to now is very much like the one you had before. You just don't see the bad parts of it. You just remember the good parts. Like the children of Israel, let's go back to Egypt. It was better when we were there. You think this new one is just like the old one in some ways, but you don't remember none of the bad stuff. All I see is the good in her. All I see is the greatness in him. All I see is the Mandingo warrior I had in the last one. I know I relate to some of you. <clears throat> Marriage is wonderful. God designed it to be wonderful. But remember that great marriages do not happen by accident. And they do not happen overnight. For your marriage to work, you have to work. You must pay attention and you must play with intention. If you don't do these things, these idols will continue to sneak into your marriages and destroy even the most promising marital relationships. One of the worst things, and I've heard this at least seven times within the last two weeks from different couples or, or one spouse in the, in the thing. I, I, I think he's messing around on me. I think she's messing around on me. What makes you think that? Matter of fact, don't even answer me because if they're not here to defend themselves, you telling me this is not doing me any better unless they come and explain what you're thinking about them and they can defend themselves. It's so hard to get people to understand the importance of why they should be married. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Why you should be one. Why you should talk like one, act like one, become one. Because that's what God says. Even the Bible tells about the, the trinity of, of the people. Father, make them one as you and I are one. They are three that bear record in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and they are one. What more do we need God to show us when it comes to marriage than marriage is about oneness? 
It's about you and I, yes, but it's about us. Why owe you and I? Amen, that's a lot of words. But when you say one, you're saying there's a unit that God has made, that we have become one flesh. Now, you see, pastor, you can come and, and try to find ways to go around all of this, and that's why I tell most of you guys when it comes to marriage, God made man equal to woman. There was no differentiation between them. You know, male and female did, made he both them, them, but they were one. Adam was one. Are you hearing me this morning? It wasn't Adam and Eve. It wasn't until the woman ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they were no longer one. God expects oneness for everything we do. Two shall walk together as one. In Ecclesiastes, how can two agree unless what? They walk together and agree as one. So when we start seeing marriages taking a different turn, don't look at the spouse and blame. You're one. <clears throat> work on the oneness and you'll find out that in the middle of all that, God will get glory out of everything. Amen. Stop trying to counterculture your spouse. What do I mean by that? Stop trying to think you can show yourself or show your spouse's ways why they're messing up. Ask God to show you both where we're messing up. And the Bible says if one hurt, we both hurt. When one is glorified, we both are glorified. It's about getting God in the place he needs to be as the husband of our lives. Then your husband can be a true husband to you. And you can be a true wife to him. The Bible is so precisely correct in everything it gives about marriage. Stop looking at your watches. It's so precisely correct about everything. I can see in the back of my head and I've got cameras back there. Everything about marriage is so direly important because when the time comes, you want to come to my office and say, Pastor, this was happening to me. But when I preach on it, all you heard was, uh, because you didn't pay attention. If you don't pay attention now, you'll pay the piper later. Give God some glory and praise in this house. <clears throat> some of you, you want me to magically call you to the front lay hands on you, wave a magic wand over your head, and all the stuff will go away. Marriage takes work. You need to start working on your marriage. Amen? You don't work on something, it'll definitely work on you. Give God some praise again. I hope I touched some corns this morning. Amen. Did we ever get Amen. the internet corrected? No. Amen, family. As we continue in the attitude of praise and worship, let us bring our tithes and offerings into the storehouses. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and our ushers will see that you receive one. Amen. Amen. Sambu. There's a healing in this room. Thank you, Lord. And it's you. Thank you for your word, Lord. Good word, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Sambu. There's a breakthrough Hallelujah. in this room. Hallelujah. It's got my name on it. Amen. So I'm gonna put a praise on it. I'm gonna put a praise on it. Somebody put a praise. Put your name in the atmosphere. 
Towards our tithes, our offering, our seed. Praise God. We thank you, Lord God. Lord of the tithe, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that you have, Lord God, gifted us, Lord God, to be able to bring our tithes into your storehouse, Lord God, that there's meat in your house, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for hearts filled, Lord God, with doing your commandments, Lord God. Lord God, I thank you for increased favor and overflowing these tithes and offerings, Lord God. Opening the eyes of our understanding more and more concerning your tithes, Lord God, that it is your commandment, Lord God. We thank you for rebuking the devourer for our sake, Lord God. We thank you for the windows of heaven being opened up, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for you doing a new thing in our life, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, for people being debt free, Lord God, in our spirit, our soul, and our body. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord, family. Praise the Lord. This is April 21st, 2024. Welcome to Freedom Covenant Center. We are a church. And we do have one visitor card. Um, it's Nisi Valentine. Amen. Come and love on our guest family. Amen. Welcome, Miss Nisi. God bless you. God bless you. You're welcome. Amen. Amen. We welcome our visitors on behalf of our pastors, Maxie and Antoinette Clark. Please remember to thank them. And uh, Sister Nisi, if you're looking for a church home, consider ours. Otherwise, take your love back to your home if you have one. You're welcome. Weekly information. Sunday morning prayer. We are, you are encouraged, we all are encouraged to attend the 9 a.m. healing service. Celebration service starts at 10.45 a.m. Amen. Ministries, we want to continue to give unto our touching hands, touching heart missions. Our mission drives continue. So please continue to um, Put that on your envelope and continue to give weekly to our mission drives. Special announcements. Please remember our sick and shut in during this uh, time of prayer. Anytime that you're praying, please continue to lift up our el elder Nellie, Sister Ernestine, Sister Danny, our brother Earl and Sister Mary Ransom, brother Willie, William, brother William, we call him brother Bill. God bless you. Raise your hand, brother Bill, so they know who you are. Amen and the Nobles family and our pastors. Continue to keep everybody lifted up in prayer. Our prayer walk continues, family, every second and fourth Sunday. For more information, please see Deaconess Anita or Elder Denise. Continue to um, make a greatest effort to come out every second and fourth Sunday. Our Seder service is tomorrow, Monday, April 22nd, 
at sundown. That's 6 p.m. here at the church, here at Freedom Covenant Center. Please sign up today after service by the piano if you haven't already signed up. Uh, someone asked me today that they won't be able to get here.